Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session of the Macau Literary Festival. Uh, today we have, we have a, a different kind of session. Uh, so I will present our uh, two guests, and then I will leave the stage, and they will present their work. Uh, so Yang Siu um she's a, a, an artist based here in Macau. She has a, a, a great uh, exhibition in Taipa Village, if you don't no, you can go there and please see it because it's it's really great. Um, she works with illustration and installation. She does books. Uh, she works in many different with many different techniques and uh, disciplines. Um, so uh, she has l uh, one particular book which is over there, Mr. Matos went to buy tomatoes, which <laughs> I particularly like. Uh, and she, she has different, uh, different uh, books and fanzines and small publications uh, that uh, you can find in some Macau bookshops, uh, independent bookshops, and that you can watch here uh, in, in the end if you want, or in the presentation. Um, this, this, this book, uh, Mr. Matos Went to Buy Tomatoes, is a, is a beautiful story set in Macau uh, about a man and a cat, and maybe about some encounters and mismatches, I, I believe. <laughs> um, Antonio Jorge Gonçalves uh, is a Portuguese artist working uh, with illustration, drawing, visual narratives, comics, uh, many things also. He's, uh, he, he, has, he has many published books uh, in different genres and solo or with other authors. Um, and he, he was on stage last night, I don't know if you saw him, <laughs> with uh, Luc Argel and Nadira Sema drawing a live on Samba de Guerrilla. Uh, his, his last book is Welcome to Paradise, uh, a collection of drawings made in Lisbon, uh, and maybe a reflection about the ways the city, and maybe all the cities, um, is and are changing. Uh, so I will let them present their work. Uh, I will go away, and then in the end, I will go back to maybe make some, some questions and have a little chat. OK? Yang, you, you are going to start, so. Hello. Hello, I'm Yang. Um, so I'll be speaking in English. And um, if you have any questions, you can also ask me in Chinese as well. And um, Sarah has just introduced a bit of my background. And I would like to um, elaborate a little bit more about my background, because um, before um, doing illustrations, I did uh, English studies in the University of Macau. And um, it was in that degree that I started, um, I, I found my love in literature. But um, I feel that I could not uh, write a lot of things in English, probably. So I was lucky enough in year four to discover that um, there is such thing called picture book. and. And it was really wonderful. So I started um, having the thought of maybe I can like try illustration in that direction. Um, probably I can find my voice in writing stories. And um, lucky enough, years later today, um, I am very happy to introduce you um, this book, Mr. Maydush, When to Buy Tomatoes. Um, it's my first picture book. And today, I would like to talk more about this book. And before that, um, I want to show you more of my work. And you can see my um, website here. So um, mostly, I do illustrations. And working here in Macau um, actually is, I, I don't think that I can call myself a full-time illustrator, because aside from taking commissions, for illustrations, most of the times I also work for other stuff, such as teaching and design jobs. So um, I try to incorporate illustrations in most of my uh, commissioned work, if I can. And here are some of them. And um, sometimes I, this is the poetry magazine called Voice and First in Hong Kong that I've been working with them for several years. and. This is the um, series of work that I illustrated for their poems. 
And actually, they are now showing in um, the Taipa Old Village as well. I was very lucky enough to have um, many space to elaborate and to explore this series because um, the editor, he just asked me to choose the poems that I want to respond to and I can like elaborate freely. So um, really thanks to this um, continuation of working with them that I get the chance to, um, to find my, what I call style maybe, in illustration. Okay, and aside from commissioned works for um, magazines and design jobs, I also like to explore st uh, in storytelling. And these are some of the fan scenes that I made. This is actually the first scene that I made in the university after my, um, my graduation in English studies. So I went, uh, to, uh, went abroad to the UK to study illustration in master. And um, this is the book about when, when the instructor, she gave me the assignment, she, was, she said that, um, please tell a story in just 12 words. So this was the, the theme of the story. And um, I end up making the 12 words in cell. So you can see many of the highlights in the story. And this is the first time that I really get the chance to explore this sequential storytelling. But to be honest, I didn't know what I was doing back then. <laughs> I just feel like um, this, is, this should be the way for storytelling. So I did it anyway. And after graduation, I went back to Macau and um, yeah, I start making more other scenes using different methods such as um, this one is called Home Sweet Home. It's different from the last one that I just mentioned because this one is more like a short comic thing while this one um, is more like an observational diary that I went to, um, went to all Macau, um, the like the McDonald's that they operate overnight. And I went there within a period of time every night to observe people who staying overnight in those McDonald's. I, w I got curious, like what kind of people would um, be staying in McDonald's and what would they do during that period of time? And this um, is very interesting to find out that in different districts, of Macau, and in those McDonald's, you can find different peoples. Some McDonald's are more in the central areas. There will be there will be more um, homeless people who's going there regularly, probably every night. They would go there and with their packages and sit for the overnight. But then they would leave early in the morning because um, people would come and eat very early in the morning. But then um, in other areas of Macau, like um, the more touristic areas, then you would find tourists bringing their luggages, staying in those areas of McDonald's, which is really um, amazing to find out that they would go there and put on their mask and slippers and be ready to, yeah, to stay overnight. So I think there's a network for sharing information about that. And I really enjoy making this um, scene a lot. And here are some of other scenes that I made. This is um, also like an observational scene in the old Macau communities, but um, in a less documented way compared to this one. And I try to explore um, riso printing in this scene. and. Um, yeah, I. So here are a few scenes that I made, and um, okay, now I'll talk about Mr. Madush went to buy tomatoes. Yeah, this name is very direct. Actually, um, you can pass around. Thank you. Thank you. 
So the premise of the story is that um, there's an artist called Mr. Matush. Yeah, he's a, it's a Portuguese last name. And I'll explain why later that I use this name. And he's an artist, and um, because his lack of inspiration in his painting, that he's been painting tomatoes lately. So he went to the local market to buy tomatoes, um, hoping that probably by eating some fresh tomatoes, he can have new inspirations on his work. And um, that's where the story starts. And in the market, there's this cat who's attracted by Mr. Matush because there's a dangling string on his toad, so it's broken, but he doesn't, he didn't know. And um, the cat tries to catch the string and accidentally the cat broke, the, the cat tore the toad open and all the tomatoes uh, fall off on the ground. And that's where the magic happens. So you can see in this story that um, when the tomatoes, they um, fall onto the ground, they start growing inversely into gigantic tomatoes that um, soon later will um, cover the whole city. And aside from the tomatoes, something else has fallen onto the ground. And because the cat, oh, actually she's called Gigi, <laughs> So Gigi tries to uh, return the thing to Mr. Maydouche. So that's about, that's um, nearly the story where it's going to. And the story would be continue with the cat and the tomatoes following Mr. Maydouche in Macau and trying to return the thing to Mr. Maydouche. So when I was um, thinking about this story, I try to I try to keep track on the rhythm and the, and the flow of the story because I want to make it more like a children's reading material, and um, I thought repetition of the story, like repeating the lines, would be interest uh, an interesting way to tell the story, such as in some of the pages. I would use a giant tomato plant with a ginger cat. What an unlikely pair to see. So this is this page. And then in the next page, I will repeat again, using a ginger cat and a giant tomato. What a clumsy pair indeed. So I try to use this repetition in um, the storytelling. But then at the same time, I, I don't want to doubt my audience. So um, in the writings, I rep uh, duplicate them, but then in the image imagery, I would use different um, composition or different visual stuffs to make it to make the whole presentation more interesting. And when they can flip, when they flip the book, they will feel like more new things are coming. And um, the other thing that I want to talk more is that I like to put um, little stuffs in the stories that because I feel like it's all these little things that um, in the setting of the story um, that makes up the whole world of Mr. Maydouche, aside from the main stories that's going on in this whole book, which is uh, Mr. Maydouche going on his way to buy the tomatoes. But aside from this main thing going on in the background, um, that's where I like to portray a lot of um, local stars, the community, and all these different um, details in the story. And um, if you look closer in the page, you can see that before this whole event has started, before this whole gigantic tomato event has started, where Mr. Matush is still picking his fresh tomatoes in the market, this guy, um, 
this guy here at the market, he's actually reading a newspaper. And in that newspaper, it writes that um, gigantic tomatoes growing everywhere, maybe in London or in worldwide phenomenon thing. Yeah, this, um, I like to drop some, this, all this kind of small hints that um, if you finish the story and you look back again, and you will find that, oh, it's, all, it, it's always been there all this time. Yeah, that's how I like to put the story this way. And yeah, here also like the guy reading the newspaper as well. And um, also in the book cover that I, I use the silk screen in printing because I want to make it simple. And here the pictorial is about Mr. Medush going to buy tomatoes. And if you look at the back of the story, actually it's like a whole wrap up of the story. Like it's always been there. Yeah, that's how I like to put my story um, in this way. And I think that's more or less that I want to talk about with this story. And yeah, <laughs> if you are interested in um, knowing more later, you can ask me. Thank you. Okay, so good morning, good morning. Um, I just want to show a little bit of my work and then we can talk later about it. Um, my work divide, is divided between paper and uh, digital performance, like last night concert. And it's quite funny that nowadays almost all my digital or performance work will end up in being on paper and all my paper work will end up being digital or, or film or internet. Um, so I'll just do a, a presentation where I will show you some examples, not all of it, but first from my paperwork. Um, comic books or graphic novels, that's where I actually came from in the sense that I did them since I was very, very small. My first professional uh, graphic novels were published in 92, since then quite a lot of books. And mostly all these comic books, these uh, visual sequences, this, this storytelling um, was made very influenced by uh, French and Belgium comics from my childhood. That's uh, a trend, let's say, this way to organize visual narratives. Uh, it's very popular in Portugal. It was wh when I was a kid. So my first books, they, they follow this kind of sequence, which is, it's a bit influenced by cinema uh, in, in one way that the way that images are uh, sequenced is influenced by the way that uh, cinema is actually uh, composed. But uh, through all these years that I've been publishing, uh, these comic books, I've worked with different writers and tried di different styles. I have to say I see myself a bit as a drawing artist, I see myself a bit as an actor in the sense that an actor will have to accommodate himself to different characters and uh, to find different uh, styles or, or different ways to approach. At, at a certain point, the computer arrived in my life uh, from the ones that are younger. Maybe this is a very uh, strange thing to think about. There was a world before computers. But the fact is that I started doing all uh, as analog. Um, like uh, on this, it was a very, I have to say, it was almost like building the pyramids in the sense that you start working for hours in something and when you're getting to the end of it, you messed up and you mess up the whole thing. So it was a completely different way to approach work. But uh, at the same po certain point, the computer arrived in my life and I started not doing so much direct digital drawing on the computer, but to edit it as 
uh, as far as I understood what you told, the same thing. I think it's quite a common process nowadays for a lot of people to start it analog and at the center point to make it uh, digital. So that that was what happened. Um, so going through all these different style of books uh, and telling different type of stories, I have to say that I arrived to one point uh, where I wanted to expand more this idea of visual narrative and not staying so close to this uh, small image to small image uh, in page, um, which was typical of comic books. I, I think I probably experimented all the almost all the possibilities that I could find. I make the effort for it, at least. Uh, so, at a certain point, uh, another thing arrived, which was, I have here some books that can circulate, for instance, this is one of the books that I was just showing uh, around, uh, one of the graphic novels, and at a certain point, uh, because I became a father, it's a stereotypical thing that parents will start doing uh, uh, books for their kids. So I start doing books for kids. I actually brought you one which is the Chinese uh, translation of one of uh, my books that can circulate as well. And found out that to do uh, what Sarah was, was calling um, picture books, uh, it's not very different from doing comic books. The only difference, main difference is that these books, which are made for small kids, they tend to have only one image in each spread instead of many images in the same pages. So I basically use the same uh, ideas, the same visual ideas, how to sequence images. I just adopted uh, to hit. And one of interesting things about picture books for young kids is that um, they normally are books that are read by both the child and an adult. Uh, and all the time I kept in mind that it will be interesting that these books will have different layers of meaning for both the adults who are reading and the kids. Like for instance, in this drawing, a small kid uh, doesn't see that that tree can actually be a brain. Uh, that's something that the adult will see. So I like to have this idea, even in these small kid books, that uh, adults still can have their own thing to read. And a lot of these stories, because they, they, these kids' books that I do, they're written and, and draw by myself. Uh, they have some autobiographical um, elements into it. Now, at a certain point, uh, something else crossed um, my path, which was uh, early this century, I started doing political cartoon in a newspaper uh, in Portugal. And uh, I did it for 18 years. And at a certain point, I, made a pub I published a book which had a selection. I'll just show you the trailer of it. <laughs> This will have some written comments in Portuguese, um, but I may, I wouldn't translate it exactly, but I can say that doing political cartoon is a very different um, activity from doing fiction uh, stories, in the sense that your stories are the world stories, or the stories that are on the news. Um, on the other hand, uh, Political cartoon, because it does exist on media, it's actually, it actually has some kind of potential power to influence people or to change people's views uh, on, on subjects, on political issues. It's actually an activity that can be quite dangerous in some parts of the world. For instance, I can tell you that I met an Iranian cartoonist which spent three years in prison because he made a drawing that made some joke about his 
president uh, who didn't like it. So, um, I mean, in France, people died for actually, they were killed, some people at Charlie Hebdo magazine were killed uh, because of it. Um, it was a very, very interesting challenge, especially because what happened with political cartoon is that you have one drawing that uh, comments a subject and you have to be very synthetic about it. You have to be very simple and very clever on showing your opinion. So it was a good exercise for me to try to make very simple and iconic images that uh, could do it. Uh, the following thing was this project uh, where I spent many years traveling worldwide, drawing people who are sitting on subway uh, trains. Uh, I did it in all the five uh, continents. I called them Subway Life. And it was like a game. I will enter uh, the train and I will have to draw the people who were sitting opposite me. Uh, I couldn't choose who I'll draw. I will have to draw uh, this person. This is the book trailer for the book that was published with it. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, exercise as well, because at the beginning I never asked people if I could do, uh, if I could draw them. Uh, so people didn't knew at the beginning when I started that they were being drawn. But because drawing takes a time to be made, uh, I will actually my activity will be discovered after a few minutes. And so I will change from being the one who's observing to be the one that it is observed. So from, from life point of view, as a life and experience, it was very, um, very, very interesting thing to do. Now, what we have next? Okay, so this will be a far more uh, recent experience. It is this book, we can pass it on. Uh, this was during, started during COVID uh, lockdown. I, I'm what I will call a sketchbook artist in the sense that I use sketchbook all the time. It's like a portable studio. And I start doing these drawings with white pencil on, on black paper. And during COVID, uh, I started going out in my neighborhood, which was very empty, as you probably remember, we all had to stay closed in our homes. And it became some sort of uh, visual, COVID visual diary, uh, if you want. This book that you can have a look now, it's just a selection of many, many, many drawings that I did. Drawings of people, of the few people that I will find on the street. Uh, drawings of things that I will see both inside home and outside. Um, and it was actually as well the first experience that I made as a um, self, uh, how do you call it in English, uh, self-publishing experience. All my other books, many books have been published by publishers. And this one is quite a special object in the sense that uh, it was printed on a sophisticated way. In, it was printed in white over black paper. And I just made a small edition that I actually uh, uh, sold myself. I found that uh, something that there's some future in it in, in independent publishing nowadays. I mean, uh, publishing business becomes a very, very global thing for some kind of, of books. It works well, but there are other things that are more special. And I think there's, there is a way to actually make this very special printed, very careful crafted uh, editions of things and sell it to a, uh, a shorter range uh, of people. Uh, this was another uh, of this, it was last year's um, self-edition as well. It was actually made more or less in the same COVID period, but it's a different thing. I, it happens that I have a very nice view of Lisbon from my window, and because I was trapped at home, I spent a lot of time looking through it. So I start painting uh, from my window this view during different days, 
and um, as well for many years I've been writing my dreams so uh, what happened is in this book I decided to uh, put together as a narrative these images that I see from my window and uh, these dreams uh, that I will dream. So it's like what I've seen during daytime and what I think or dream during, during nighttime. Uh, this is my recent book. It's this one, Sada, if you want to make it circulate. And uh, a lot of my work uh, relates with my hometown, Lisbon. Uh, I like the, the space of the city in general, but my hometown in particular, because it's my home. And it is a visual diary in some way as well, because I will go out on the streets looking at all these tourists. Lisbon became very, very touristy in the last 10 or 15 years that has been changing the city and because I really live in the center center of a very touristic part of Lisbon uh, I was very curious to go out and see what do these people do how they behave it's like I was a National Geographic reporter going and observing different animals and their habits and mating habits and things like that. So the book, it's, it is something like that. Now, concerning the way that I will exhibit out of the book format, uh, I don't like much the traditional way of framing things and putting them on the wall. So if I will have to do it, I will prefer like do it like this, like enlarge it to, to very big size and, and put it without uh, frames. But what I really like, it's different formats. Like I had the possibility some years ago to show on subway stations on the light boxes where you normally find advertising. I was lucky enough to have the whole station to have my own drawings. And even if most part of people on subway doesn't care about what is there, uh, it was interesting for me to be around and to see that s suddenly somebody, one person in the middle of 100 people will notice there's something different that's, that is not advertising, that, that is something else. Or, for instance, like this exhibition that um, I have to, to go, that goes with a, a show, a drawing show that I do, uh, which is about graffiti, and uh, I've made these small boxes uh, with elements. Um, so I like to think other ways to ex to exhibit it, my work. Now that's an example of a thing that goes a little bit out of our, what I normally do, but I thought it would be interesting to share it with you, which is I had this possibility for one year I was working with a team doing the decoration of a child hospital, the whole child hospital. I had to, to study all spaces that a, a hospital have and trying to find a way to create visual elements that will help kids and their parents to make those moments which as you can imagine in a hospital are very difficult. So I basically created animals because I think that animals it's something that a child and even humans can relate much easily than other humans. Uh, and I tried, since this is a space, is not a gallery, I tried to find ways for these animals to be present anywhere and to follow the, the architectural configuration um, of, of space. So being like these images, being like some sort of skin that just go on the walls and all, in all uh, elements. Uh, the very interesting thing about this project is that I had to work with, with a team of doctors and nurses and, and people who actually were telling me what I could do and, and what I couldn't do. These spaces are, are, are very special spaces. Now, for the second half of my work, which is the, the live work, the, the stage work, I started in 94 working in theater um, just because uh, one of the writers that I used to work with my comic books uh, was doing the theater play and he asked me to do the set design. 
Uh, and since this very first moment, then I didn't have a computer, uh, but uh, I started projecting images on stage. That was something that was quite natural. Then I went studying a bit of it, um, and uh, at a certain point I got a mobile uh, computer, a laptop computer, and started connecting to a video projector, something that now it's very common, but then wasn't very common common at all, and start doing my own performances using uh, my drawing both as a set design of some kind, but as well as a lightning design. Many of these early performances, uh, I was drawing the light that will go on illuminating people. I did, uh, I started with musicians, actors, Dance was a very interesting field for me to work with, mainly because contemporary dance, uh, it's, it has a, a story, a history of last uh, 60, 70 years being very open to cross-media. Uh, but music was probably, uh, musicians were probably the people that I've worked this year since 2003, uh, which was when I started doing it. And... Um, with them, I really learned what was uh, the main characteristic of this work that separated from my paperwork, which is time. All performance is about time. You have, it's not so much about uh, a, the, a size of a paper as we think when, when we look at paper. It's more like if I will have a 20 minute performance or if I will have a two hour performance, how am I going to deal with this time canvases? Uh, that's something that you can't see particularly with these images because they're still images and this work is obviously a, a moving uh, work. But just to show you a few examples from both things like, for instance, pop musicians that uh, I've joined on tour uh, for some time, like, like Luc Argel, and uh, shows that I created myself doing this, the global set design and writing it and, and, and uh, inviting other performances to, to have part of it. Uh, for instance, this is a performance that I do with this pianist that I work a lot, Philippe, and a writer on Jackie and Golan writer that I do books uh, as well. And for instance, this performance is uh, a performance where we're all improvising. We're all telling a story, but it's completely improvised. So uh, the writer is writing and what he's writing is being projected as well, at the same time as my drawing, on the top of my drawing, Philip is playing. And it's not a question of the writer writing something and me and the pianist following. It's much more dynamic. Any of us are leading the story, like uh, the writer can be talking about some scene and I will, dry, I will draw some character that he didn't mention. That will oblige him to go on doing something with it. Or we can be in some sort of mood, let's say a very calm mood, but if the pianist will start making something really energetic, you will push us to do something. So it's really like a moving triangle and that's probably the thing for me that I most like about my performance work is that is always a collaboration uh, work. Now I have here a two minute, whoops, two minute uh, video that will just show you a bit of making off of a concert that I did uh, with this uh, Baroque, uh, no, this wasn't the Baroque, but it was an orchestra. And um, it will just probably give you uh, a bit of the flavor of, of the, the interaction between the music and the drawing, especially uh, you will notice that the physicality of the drawing, maybe it's not that different from the mu musical uh, physicality. Uh, it's the body translating uh, something. A lot of these images are uh, accelerated so that you can see a bit more of the course of the drawing. If they were just shown on, on real time, you wouldn't see uh, much. And at this time, I was already mixing with this live drawing uh, the use of uh, photographs, like I did uh, with Lucargel last night. 
uh, images that I have already in the computer and that I can draw on top or manipulate in the way uh, that I want. I have here a book as well that was made uh, about some of my about some of my performance work. You can have a, a look on it. This, these drawings, they will. The thing in, interesting about projections is that uh, that's not really a format. Projection can be very small, can be very big. Sometimes uh, some set design will be made specific for specifically for these um, projections. I do really like myself to do it outside. Uh, uh, I like when the drawings can be some sort of skin in the city, some kind of palimpsest uh, so superimposed uh, over the, sp the, the public space, not just because the scale difference, but I can uh, even work with, with the, the, the format of architectural space to play with it, to make it some part uh, of the drawing itself. Um, even places like boats, for instance, you can draw uh, on on the top of a boat. And in Lisbon specifically, I've worked many times in in the castle, in the main castle, Castel de São Jorge, uh, which is very interesting because there is a texture uh, on the walls that become part um, of the drawing itself. Uh, I will show you a trailer uh, of a film that I've made. This wasn't a live performance. It was a fi film that I've made with, with a team. I wrote it, I directed it. It's just sound and image. And it was about Lisbon. It was um, projected every night. It's a more sophisticated piece incorporating a lot of um, iconography from the last 500 years uh, of the city. But I think that when this was a very, very, very large projection in the castle, I think that 
when one makes a film that is made to be projected like this in public space with people around, it becomes some kind of uh, performance as well. Uh, at a certain point, uh, I started using um, the overhead uh, projector, which is an old piece of technology, it's like a, a um, light box with a lens and a mirror that uh, make it possible to work with transparencies and, and shapes. Uh, this was, for me, was very uh, suited to work to creations for kids as well. And even sometimes, like in this show, I will work with two overhead projectors. By contrast with the computer, it's a very simple technology, but again, I think all possibilities are interesting. Um, at the end, just to show you that I did turn this kind of uh, digital drawing, life drawing, into some film sometimes, like doing these small bits, uh, no normally for media purpose. It's just another way, it's not exactly animation, it's more like using the process uh, of creating a drawing as as a film, this for uh, an online event, and this one for the main Portuguese TV um, as a separator, as something that will go between uh, programs. People are said to be injured, and there are some reports. COVID-19 so that's it, basically. Um, currently, I'm working as well on a TV program about uh, people that makes drawings, like Sarah, for instance. Uh, so that's it. Just trying to keep it expanded. Thank you so much. Uh, for your okay, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I, I I must I, I think I, I really need to know why Mr. Matos is called Mr. Matos. <laughs> you didn't tell the story, and I'm thinking about it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'll show a bit more. So I was when I was um, planning to how to like what name should I um, should I be giving to my um, protagonist? And actually, at that time, my cat, um, which is called Rice, and in uh, Cantonese is Mai Zai, Mai Zai. So um, she just passed away during that period, and then um, in in a way to memorize honor her, um, um, in memory her, that um, I put traces of her into the drawing and suddenly it suddenly makes sense of the whole story because um, even though it's not mentioned that um, Mr. Matush once has a cat but the the start of the story um, mentions that um, he rarely leaves the house and he always um, closes his curtain. And at that point, suddenly it makes sense because he feels he feels sad and because um, his cat has left him. So um, that's why I decided to name him um, in Cantonese, Mai Xin Sang. So it's my yeah, and um, I wanted it to rhyme in English and Portuguese as well. So I was I looked up like what names, what sounds that would rhymes with my and ends up Mr. Madush. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and um, it makes sense because um, in Macau, like he's a Portuguese man living in Macau. Yeah, so that's how it comes from. Okay. Thank you. I, I was really curious about uh, the story <laughs> of Mr. Matos. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, if any of you want to ask something or make some comment first, uh, you can have the mic and you, you want. Uh, 
thank you for both for this very very interesting works. Um, I just have one uh, question for both actually. Um, uh, Yingxiu, you also work with digital format, right? Or is mainly paper? I work with um, both analogical as well as digital. Okay, because I was going to ask for the for the process um, for both. Uh, how do you how do you um, how do you start with it? Do you already have the concept in your mind? And with the digital process, um, are you discovering as a time that you are drawing it, and then um, you add more or less layers, then you have time to correct it, and uh, and then it's a continuing process. Or is a very you, you already have a draft behind it, and then you you you, you just try to make it more perfect until 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 you think it's over. And that's the next question. With the digital process, is it harder for you to know when the when the illustration is is it's finished, um, and is it very different from uh, from the from the paper in that in that. Um, in that way, to know when is the art, when is the illustration finished. I'll, I'll start with you, and then I'd like to hear Antonia. Okay. Um, actually, um, the process of this book takes a bit longer than my usual work, because uh, first of all, it's a personal work, so um, I really look uh, I really took the opportunity to experiment with the materials and the uh, method that I would like to use to finish this whole book. And um, after d doing the storyboard, I then came up with a more ready um, sketch, like for all the pages that I wanted to be in digital form first, because um, I work faster with digital um, work, uh, digital drawing, and then I would um, e experiment with all these colors and how it works. And after that, um, after the digital sketch is ready, then I would think um, like what final material that I would use. And I actually experimented with a few different methods, such as watercolor and um, um, gouache, maybe like different materials and even print making because um, at yeah also again it's my personal work so I took many time to um, experiment and in the end I came up with this um, analog method of using um, ink brush drawing on tracing paper because um, I found that I accidentally found that the effect is uh, has been something that I've been looking for. Then I um, quickly I finish all these um, outlines of the um, work of the whole book, and then I um, I scanned them and colored them in the computer digitally. So it was a, a mixture of both thing. And um, yeah, answering your second question, it took many times. And after finishing the pages, I start working with the text, like fine tuning them. And I wanted to make it more lyrical and sounds a bit um, fun to read. And I, I don't want um, I don't want the text just repeating or describing what's already there in the book. I wanted to um, interact a bit more with the audience with the reader. And in that process, I then discover, oh, maybe I don't have enough illustration. So I went back to work a bit more on illustration. It's like going back and forth and um, fixing it to make it look like a complete uh, body of work. And um, actually, I it took me two years to really finish the whole thing that um, I added four or five illustrations after I finished the text. And then I go, after I finished all the illustration, I went back to work on the text again. So at a point that I thought, oh, I might never finish this book. It just takes forever. And I don't have any deadlines. I can just keep working to perfect it in my own, uh, own perspective of time. And um, I think it was when that, um, the when you, look at it and it actually feels like a 
whole thing, complete thing, that is the time when you feel you are ready, ready to um, to move on to the next step to publish it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, quite an interesting question, and I think that Sarah was just giving a very important clue for it now. Yan, Yang. Well, Sarah is easier for me. Is it okay to call you Sarah? Uh, Sara was just saying this thing that uh, when I'm doing this personal work I have all the time uh, and from both my experience and, and mainly other artists work with uh, illustration printing work I think the the digital wins because of time uh, digital makes it faster generally so uh, I think it's a global question, contemporary question. We all tend up to be um, taken by digital because it just makes it easier and faster things. Um, I was born in analog. Uh, I didn't have any computers till I was uh, almost 30. So um, it is actually a different process. I, I, I was raised on being patient about drawing something that might not be very popular nowadays uh, and especially with comic books comic books it's a crazy time consuming occupation you i, I mean you you might not have idea uh, how long it takes because you need to draw the characters many times they their face can't change they have to be recognized <laughs> you have to choose <coughs> everything from scenery and etc. Sorry, I just need some water. <coughs> but what happens nowadays, which I think that's very common in many people, is that we start with analog somehow. Some people even do the analog and then draw digitally on the top of the analog, scan the drawings. But very important thing nowadays we tend not to think about is that every, some, everything becomes digital. The moment that you scan an original drawing, it becomes digital. Uh, it's not analog anymore, it's something else. So I think at the end, we even when we do analog, we uh, will have to think that that will become digital somehow. Um, my only digital activity is the performance work, for obvious reasons, because it's the machine that makes it possible. But uh, nowadays, from the last three years, I've been trying to do as much analog as I can do. For instance, uh, that small black book that you've seen of the, the, the white drawings, it was completely analog uh, and because I do teach comic books in the fine arts school in Lisbon I tend to convince try to convince my students about it which is analog will put us in a very different uh, perspective the thing is when we do something that it's analog thinking that goes digital we go like oh that uh, uh, doesn't matter i will make it better once it's in the computer so you sort of you do not invest yourself in the percent you do something oh this is not going very well but i can i can make it better uh, and the, the the time in the computer is a different time the time in the computer first thing is that you will start like this and you end up like this. So, so it's, you do not engage yourself in the same way. And especially the worst thing I found myself is that the, the, the work in the computer can be endless. You never finish. That's why I say you never finish. You always have an option. You can always change it. You can always have the idea that you're going to make it better. You can always have another option. And I found that's not very good on the creation process. Um, I like to have limitations. I think limitations in the whole history of art uh, are, have always been a very important thing because it's the moment that you know, this is what I can do, I can't do that, I can't do that, I have to, I have to make it all only with this pen and this bottle of water and this piece of paper. <coughs> that will 
oblige us to make decisions. We'll have to be sharper on it. On the computer, we can just lose ourselves. So, apart from that, from a physical point of view, since I'm not uh, that young anymore, I have to tell you as well that I found the analogical world from the physical and mental point of view much more fulfilling. I mean, there's much more pleasure on spending a whole day in front of paper and, and, and pens and, and inks rather than uh, a square. That's the other thing. Um, you're, with, with digital, you're tied to this proportion. Not just the size, but a proportion of length and height. And that limits your brain as well because you start thinking in this proportion. Uh, when you're doing it manually, you can be much more inventive about what you're doing. So, I think it's basically the difference between walking and getting there by car. I do prefer walking. Thank you. Is, is there a point when you are creating a story, and now I'm talking about narratives, stories, um, where when the the technique you you decided to work with starts to define the the narrative or that never happens yeah that's interesting because artists work on different ways you'll be surprised there's so many things in common but at the same time every uh, because we're all different we will look at things for instance i know people who do this with this kind of figurative drawing that tell me that they have the image in their head and then they have to find the process to do it. Other people, for working on a, on a certain time of, of um, system, they will think in this system. Like, for instance, uh, in comic books, normally there's a process where you have to draw the line of the drawing, maybe in pencil or whatever, and then you have to put color in it. So that will make you think the drawing from the beginning from that point of view. Personally, uh, I never know exactly how things going at the very beginning when I'm starting a project. So I don't even know what I will draw and sometimes are accidents with material that sometimes will suggest things and then I will follow through. So, uh, I guess that's what it is. For me, um, try to draw something, it's always a question of smell somehow. It's like there is some kind of smell in things, there is a, a kind of a feeling and I will have to try it out, all materials, to try to find which one will gonna make that smell goes into the paper appearing. Yeah, I I also feel that um, I, I think that different materials would really affect that what you um, what what your outcome is. Uh, for instance, that uh, when I went sketching, I would um, bring a limited amount of. Um, of supplies with me. Sometimes I would bring uh, watercolor, and sometimes I would only bring um, some, like three to four colors of color pencil, and that's it. So um, each time with um, with the different materials that I brought, and they would limit me in that moment that I would just use that kind of things to finish what I uh, feel like while I was sketching using that. Um, thing and um, I, I, I can, uh, how to say, I really feel, understand that what you say is um, you only f know what you're going to draw the moment that um, you start drawing it because even though sometimes when you have this um, idea of like what you want to draw but then actually what it comes out is can be a totally different thing depending on the materials that you use and it compares to what it's in your mind when you picture it, how it would be like. So, yeah, materials sometimes really um, affect the thing that comes up. 
what what you just said for me it's really the core of the thing when i see that with with my daughter and when with students that something is really part of of somebody who draws ex experience of things is that gap between what you think you're going to do and what it happens for a lot of people it feels really frustrating and people who doesn't follow drawing sometimes gave up they will think that's their problem and they don't realize that every it's every drawing artist's problem uh, so with the years i arrived to get to this sort of conclusions that our own style it's what happened when you think about doing something and that's the way that you actually are able to do it and that's what you call style it's your mistake it's the way that you actually can do it I, I totally agree with you like um, I also teach um, in the school and uh, some many times my students will ask me can I use that like how would that work and then I will always tell them why don't you try just like uh, if you have this in mind why don't you actually like try it with on this small paper and you would find it out <laughs> and see what happened yeah it's just that step where um where you think and then you start doing it that you will know how it works out okay the, anyone wants to add something or no, so maybe I, I, I will make a, a one last question for, well, one for you and one for you. Um, uh, yeah, this, this, this book, uh, Mr. Mr. Martos, is a story told in pictures and, um, well, it, it takes place here in Macau. And I want to understand if the, the place was really important or not so much for telling the story. What was the, the place of uh, Macau in your way of telling this story. Yes, the story um, set take place in Macau, and um, for for my um, for me personal, I think this is very important because um, it's the place that I live, and um, and I like to put as much as possible the stuff that's around me into the story visually, and um, I take it as a way to collect stuff and this is my way and um, but at the same time that I don't want it to be like a thing that stops um, stops other audiences like people outside of Macau from understanding or reading this story so um, even though the set is here in Macau and all this visual stuff, but then it won't uh, interfere with the main stories. It won't, um, it won't stop people outside of Macau from understanding the story, um, but at the same time, it will add a more layer of meaning for people who live here and people who recognize all these little things in the story, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Antonio, I, I'm also curious if you are drawing here in Macau, if you draw anything, uh, or if it, we, if you will draw anything about Macau. Uh, I did draw, did draw a little bit, but uh, I do have some drawings uh, that I would like to make uh, when I'll have the time. Um, quite a short visit. Uh, the problem with drawing, drawing takes time. And uh, just until yesterday with the concert was almost impossible to gag. I did draw a little bit at the hotel. Um, but there are drawings that I don't know exactly what they are, that uh, I know that when I'll go back, I will, I will make them. We will find out. when they Hopefully. <laughs> well, uh, I think we're, we can finish. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being here to and to, for sharing your work with us. Um, and uh, thank you so much also to all of you. And uh, in the afternoon, there will be more sessions in the festival. Uh, so you are invited to come back to Casa Garden. Thank you so much. <laughs>